We've gotten so good at shrinking our transistors that on our latest chips, we have as many as two billion transistors on a little square of silicon, which is pretty amazing that they're so small. And to give you some more size perspective, each one of these squares, which you can see is smaller than a thumbtack, is one of the microprocessors that runs your computer. Now think about these physical limitations I mentioned. The first one is heat. On every single one of those squares, we have a tremendous amount of energy uh, going through one of these microprocessors, those transistors turning off and on quickly, that's a lot of electricity going through a very small space. And that friction of those electrons going through that space is what's generating all this heat. That's a problem we need to overcome. And the second problem is size. The transistors are already so small that we're running into the physical limits of having tools that would actually make transistors even smaller. Now, if we're gonna keep advancing our computers and shrinking transistors and putting more on chips, we need to overcome these physical limits. And there are scientists and engineers in the field of nanotechnology that deal with these tiny nanoscale devices that are working on solving these problems. And they think we have two options, two technologies that will take us into the future. The first one is new materials. Are there new materials instead of silicon that could solve some of our heat and size issues? And the second solution are new switches, totally new ways our computers could represent ones and zeros of computing language instead of electrical switches. So let's explore some of these new materials first. I have a gigantic model of a carbon nanotube right here. You can see that shape and structure, it's a long skinny tube made entirely of carbon with these six-sided hexagon-shaped carbon rings. Now, um, the real ones are tiny. This is much bigger than a regular nanotube. The real ones are only one or two nanometers across. Now, we could use these to make much smaller transistors than the ones we use today. And because of their really special properties, because of the shape and structure, they can control the flow of electricity very, very easily with very little power. Electricity zooms through carbon nanotubes easily. Now also, um, they have much smaller size than our current transistors, and they have very good thermal conduction, so we can get rid of the heat and dissipate the heat very easily. So this is a very promising new material that could help us make smaller, better, faster computers that don't heat up as much. Now, another material that's related is called graphene. And I want you to imagine taking a carbon nanotube and kind of slicing it down the middle and laying it into a flat sheet then I would get a sheet of graphene that's basically one atom thick, but it has that same, same uh, carbon ring structure made entirely of carbon. Now this is the thinnest material we've ever discovered. It is a single sheet of atoms. Now it's related to a material that you've heard about. So this is graphene. The material that you probably heard about is graphite. And a whole bunch of graphene sheets stacked on top of one another, like this picture, is graphite. Now you're probably most familiar with graphite as the soft gray material that's in the center of a pencil. And a lot of people don't realize that it actually does have really cool electrical and thermal properties. And I can demonstrate that for you with a simple circuit. I have a battery and a light bulb and some wires, and this pencil has been sharpened on both ends to expose the graphite that runs through the center. If I simply close this circuit, you can see that my light bulb lights right up, showing that the electricity can travel right through the pencil or right through the graphite. Now, scientists knew that if we really wanted to use graphene or graphite for a lot of applications, we would need to get rid of all the impurities and get just a single sheet. But scientists didn't think it was possible. They thought a single sheet of atoms wouldn't be stable. It would buckle or scroll into a tube. And it was just until six years ago, in 2004, this man by the name of Andrew Gein was able to isolate a single sheet of graphene. And he did it with very high-tech equipment like scotch tape. He actually took graphite crystal, similar to what you find in a pencil, and scotch tape. And he used the tape to peel off incrementally thinner and thinner bits of graphite until he had a single flake of graphene. Now luckily we have much better ways of fabricating graphene nowadays than scotch tape, but that is how it started. And research just exploded around graphene ever since because it's such a useful material. We can use it to make transistors. You can see on the right, this picture shows a sheet of graphene that has a special shape. And when we control the shape of the graphene by getting rid of the carbon atoms that we don't want, we can control the flow of electricity and make an electrical switch that we can turn off or on very, very easily. 
Um, so this could lead to tiny transistors that use very little power, that don't generate much heat, that are only a few carbon atoms wide, which is incredible. Now this will take us another decade or so into the future of computing, but we're gonna run into those physical limits again. We're not gonna be able to shrink transistors smaller than a few carbon atoms. So what do we do then? And that's why there are a whole other area of uh, researchers working on new paradigms, new switches. How else can we represent the ones and zeros of computing language if we don't use electricity? So one idea is optical computing. So instead of using moving electrons, what if we used photons, packets of light energy? Now we already use photons to do long range data communication. You probably heard of fiber optic cables. But we haven't yet figured out how do we use this technology on a very small scale within a computer to do data processing. But it's a very promising idea because photons travel much faster than electricity and they don't generate nearly as much heat. So it could lead to faster, cooler computers. And another idea is spintronics or quantum computing. Now while this does use electrons, it doesn't use the movement or charge of electrons, which is what electricity is. It uses other properties of electrons called spin. Now electrons spin in one of two directions. Spin up could represent the one of computing language. Spin down could represent the zero of computing language. And because we're talking about individual electrons, every single atom could store many, many pieces of information, many ones and zeros. It's very promising for high density information storage and processing. Additionally, quantum computing would take advantage of the complex quantum mechanics of electrons. Now the details are, are quite complex, but the idea is infinite parallel processing computers more powerful than you could ever imagine. It's a very exciting idea, but a little further off into the future. You won't see quantum computing for several more decades yet, but it is an exciting idea of where our future computing could go. So what does all of this mean? Well, it means we will probably continue to have smaller, better, faster computers for the foreseeable future. Now, you might be wondering why. Why do we even need computers that are better and faster than the ones we have today? What are the risks or benefits of these types of computers? Now we've all seen science fiction depictions of what computers of our future might do to our world. Think about Terminator or iRobot, Minority Report, The Matrix, even 2001 the Space Odyssey. Now those are all science fiction, but what realistically could we see in the next few decades? And I have a couple of ideas from experts in the field just to get your imaginations going. The first one, imagine totally new ways to interface with our computers, being done with laptops and keyboards, and instead having tiny computers that you could wear like buttons or headbands that you could wear around your head and using things like speech or eye movements or brain waves to communicate directly with your computer. That's possible with smaller, better, faster computers. Or more personalized, better medical treatments. When we sequenced the human genome, it was an incredible computational breakthrough. And the better we understand complex systems like how proteins and genes behave and interact, we could design more personalized and more effective medical treatments. Or what about artificial intelligence? How long until we actually have a computer that works as well or better than a human brain? All of those are possibilities, along with so many that we can't even begin to imagine. Now, there are risks we need to take into account too. So I want you to think a little bit about how much personal information is already collected about you. Web browsers track which websites you visit. Credit cards track what you buy and where you buy it. A GPS in your phone or car tracks your location. Now right now we don't really have the storage or processing power to kind of keep this information or network it together so we can act on it in real time. But how will that change in the future? Are we going to live in a world where information about your location is sold to advertisers? So as you walk around the city they bombard you for advertisements for every store that you walk by. Or what if the government had enough storage and processing power to record every single cell phone conversation spoken and automatically scan them for criminal conversations? Those are possibilities as well. Now I for one hope our future holds a balance, one where computers can make our lives easier and better and more convenient, more efficient, but where our privacies are also protected. The key is just to be aware that these advances in computing are happening, to be aware how they might be impacting your life, 
and to weigh in on the debate early. I hope I gave you a little bit of food for thought on the future of computing. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Please come on up after the show. Otherwise, just enjoy the rest of your day here at the museum. Thank you very much.